Good evening. Thanks so all. Thank you all so much for coming out on such a blustery night. Although I think it will be well worth it uh, for the uh, first in our winter spring 2013 series of uh, entrepreneurship events. We have a very special guest, Joe Polizzi. But before he starts, I want to give you a few um, housekeeping uh, items here. I'd like you all to silence your cell phones. Um, I want to point out over here that we do have a camera. In case you don't know, we film all of our ev events. They are going to be on our website as streaming video. We also offer podcasts of these programs, and the PowerPoint slides are up on our website as well. So if you go to the Burton Morgan page on our website, which is hudsonlibrary.org, you can find on under past programs the slides if you wanted to refer back to anything, because I did... Joe has 80 slides, so I didn't make up uh, handouts for the slides. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so we'll be here until tomorrow. Uh, um, I also want to let you know that we have a printed version of our winter-spring series at the back, so make sure you grab one of these before you leave tonight. Okay? And um, without any further ado, let's uh, give it up for Joe. All right. Fantastic. Everybody's staying warm, I hope. You know, I think that we, since we had those warm spells over the past couple of years, and now we, my kids were off school yesterday for cold. And we're, I live on the west side. I live in West Park, Cleveland. I'm like, are you kidding me? For cold? When did we stop being Ohioans? Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I am from West Park, uh, west side of Cleveland. Most of the speaking that I do is not in this area, so I'm really happy to do this. This is fun. I'll actually, I'm leaving to first thing tomorrow morning. I got two presentations in New York. I do, we were just talking, I, I do about 60, uh, last year I did about 60 in-person presentations, mostly for marketing folks. We work with mostly Fortune 1000 companies. Our customers are Petco, AT&T, Allstate, those types of companies. And we teach them the stuff that I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, but I've got, there's a different audience. You're all from different places. But just so I have a feel, how many of you are entrepreneurs, own your own businesses? All right, so most of you. So the way that I set this up, this is, I'm going to go big to small. So I got a lot of case studies from big brands, and you're going to say, I can't do that with that budget. And then we're going to come down to a lot of the stuff that we've done. Uh, I own my own business, Content Marketing Institute, launched it in 2007. I'll talk to you about the specific things we did with literally no money. So there's things that you can do if you have a budget. That's fantastic. And if you can't, that's fine. And hopefully, you'll at least get away with something uh, that'll be useful, or I'll entertain you for an hour. And by the way, if you have any questions at any time, please, you know, let's keep this very informal. Let me know, and, and we'll get to the questions. All right. So I, I do have 80 slides, but I don't stay, <laughs> I don't stay on and I don't stay on each slide very long. So we'll move pretty fast for the whole thing. I'm going to talk about uh, what I want to go through is a history of content marketing. Just so I know, when you saw the flyer and you decided to come here, how many of you have heard the term of content marketing before? Wow, that is fantastic. That is, so most of you have heard of it before. I started using the term back in 2001 when I worked at Penton Media, downtown Cleveland. I worked at Penton. Everybody familiar with Penton? Large B2B uh, media publisher. I ran their custom media group from 2001 to 2007. We started playing around with the term in 2001. And um, luckily for us in our business, and I'll share with you some of the details of our business, it took off. And it's really, really helped us grow fast because all marketers are starting to use the same terminology, which is really important. Custom, content marketing used to be called custom publishing, branded content, custom content, corporate content, customer media, and about 10 other terms that we could throw out. And now it seems like the industry is coming into content marketing. If you don't know what content marketing is, you will know it by the time you leave after these 79 other slides. Uh, I'll talk about some research, the problem with what, and I'm going to get into some essentials that I think you should look at from content marketing, what I like to call the kind of the move from good to great. How do we create compelling content to attract and retain customers? So my goal is, anybody see the movie City Slickers? 
Yeah. You know, when the char Jack Palance's character says, you know, there's one thing, that's what I always want to give to you, is there's one thing when you leave, you'll say, wow, I got one thing out of this, and I'm able to really use that in my business tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get that one thing out of today, don't come up and talk to me afterwards. I don't want to hear about it. Hopefully you will get that out and we'll, uh, we'll all go home happy. So I want to tell you a little story to start off. Some of you who have seen me present know this story, so don't give it away. But I want to talk to you, since we're all entrepreneurs here, I want to talk about innovation. Most of us in launching our businesses, we had some sort of innovation, some sort of idea that we said, hey, if we can execute this idea, we can change the world. We can change our lives. We can change our family environment. I don't have to report to the man anymore. How, whatever reason you, you had for creating, which I, I'm proud of all of you because I, as, an, as we're going on, we were talking, I have a six year anniversary I'm going on for our business and I know how amazing it is to be an entrepreneur and what you have to go through and the sacrifices you have to make. This, is, uh, this entrepreneurial story happened in 1837, Grand Detour, Illinois, and let's just call the person John. John had a really amazing innovation and an idea, and that was at the time when a plow went through dirt, plows were made out of iron, and mud and dirt sticks to iron, and, it was, and oftentimes you had to you know, get out and clear off the mud so that you could get that plow continue to move through the dirt. John had an innovation and said, look, if we can tip these plows with steel, they don't stick and they can move through the dirt. This is an amazing innovation. But John, and it worked, but John had no money. Uh, he had no marketing budget. Uh, he had very limited resources. And John was like, how can I grow my business? Because I don't have any of these things to grow. What am I going to do? Nobody will listen to me. Nobody will pay attention to me. I don't know if anybody's ever been in that situation. You feel like you have limited budget. It's exactly the position John was in. I said, look, so I can't market, what can I do? So what John did, John was targeting farmers, obviously, one of these farmers to buy these plows. So he went and said, look, if I can put together classes and teach farmers on how to be better business owners and teach them about all the things that will solve their pain points from being a business owner from a farming perspective, they'll listen to me, they'll think that, I'm important, they'll think that what I have to say is credible, they'll trust me, and if they trust me, maybe they will then buy stuff from me. He started putting together these classes in his area, and they were selling out. He was getting all kinds of people going to these classes, and then, oh, by the way, people were saying, John, you know, you're not selling anything in these classes, what do you do? He said, well, it's funny you ask that. I've got this new plow, and the rest is history. Anybody know who John was? Want to take a guess? John Deere, that's absolutely, you guys are good. It was John Deere. So John Deere, what's wonderful about the John Deere philosophy is John started out with a, John Deere started out with a philosophy of teaching and helping. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today with content marketing, because that's exactly what it is. In the late 1800s, John Deere continued this, and they said, look, you know, you couldn't feasibly create, he, at least at the time, they didn't think they could do these sessions all around the country. I said, how do we spread our message and our helpful message across to business owners all over the world? And they said, look, we can create a print magazine. And we can put these stories and these helpful tips in a magazine called The Furrow. This is from 1931, but the magazine was developed in 1896. And by the way, that magazine called The Furrow is still in production today. And if you know anything about uh, your farm media, it is the number one circulated farming magazine in the world. And what's interesting about that is John Deere's not a media company. John Deere is a company just like you or I trying to sell products or services. And here it is today, the Furrow Magazine. 1.5 million people subscribe to that magazine, uh, 14 languages, 40 countries, and then the most uh, popular circulated. So I tell you this story because a lot of people think that content marketing is brand new. Content marketing has been around since the dawn of time. John Deere has given a lot of credit for being the innovators behind actually the first moment, which we'll use often in the industry, and saying the Furrow magazine was the moment the content marketing industry was created. Um, but this idea of helpful and helping and teaching is very, very important. I'll show you a lot of examples around that. Anybody uh, know how Jell-O got their big start? If you think about it, this is back in 1904. I mean, when we go to the grocery store today, 
you see, I mean, what is there, like 100 different kinds of Greek yogurt? I mean, there's, there's all kinds of these new products, and we're used to them. We're used to new product launches. But if you think about Jell-O, how, did you, how do you market Jell-O back in the early 1900s? It must have been so odd to say, oh, take, let's take, take some warm water, let's sprinkle some pixie dust in it, and if you put it and you make it cold, you start jiggling, and then you can make different colors out of it. Really, really odd. And there were two, actually, there were two owners previous to the one that really made Jell-O go. They couldn't figure it out either. So Jell-O was sold, and the next owner got it, and they said, look, we've got to get Jell-O in the hands of our customers if we're going to make this work. And they said, how do we do that? Because it's such a weird product. So what they did was, in, their, in the local areas, they went door to door and gave away free recipe books. Just helpful recipes of the day, and in some of those recipes they put Jell-O ingredients. And then they had Jell-O stocked in the local grocery store, so when people asked about it, it was there. So very simple concept, but it's the idea that they gave away helpful information, had a tie into their product, and then a year later from doing that, they became a million dollar brand, and now they're the multi-billion dollar brand of Jell-O that we all know and love. So content marketing is very, very old. But there's a lot of things today that make it accessible for all of us, whether you have resources or not. And I want to give sort of a formal definition so you have it. There's a couple points in here that are really important. The easy definition to think about content marketing is you as a business, you're starting to act more like a media company and a publisher than you would normally to market your services. So think not advertising. I'm not going to rent somebody else's channel and distract them with a message about my product. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to create my own media. That would be newsletters, blogs, social media, my own content that's very, very helpful. I'm going to create compelling content on a consistent basis to do what? To attract and retain customers. And what ultimately do I want to see? I want to see a change in behavior or maintaining some kind of behavior. We're trying to attract or retain customers. If you're not attracting or retaining customers with your content, you're just creating content. That's not content marketing. Obviously, that's why we're here. We want to grow our businesses in some way. So what's really new about this whole thing is owned media. People talk about paid media, earned media, and owned media. We all know the paid media, right? You know you've got, you can place advertising, you can go exhibit at trade shows. That's paid media. Owned media, those are all the channels that you can create that, you, that positions you as a thought leader and an expert. And we have lots of channels we'll talk about today. Very, very important. And that can lead to earned media. People talking about you in the press, word of mouth marketing, those types of things. I believe that content marketing is so critical today for you to be successful. And I'll give you some more examples on why I think that is. So I want to give you another perspective on this. I just said a second ago, it's thinking and acting like a publisher. So when you think about what a publisher does, what a media company does, and what you do to create your content, there's actually only, so let's say you're over here. We'll put your, think about your brand. We'll put it right here next to Google, right next to DuPont. So here's where we are. We create content over there, and then we've got Wall Street Journal. We've got your, your, uh, the Plain Dealer. Uh, we've got uh, WTAM Radio. Those are publishers and media companies over here. They're all, both sides are actually creating the same type of content. There's only one thing that differentiates the one from the other. Does anybody want to take a wild guess on what that is? This is a very, very new thing that's happened. There's one thing that separates the content that's created on the marketing side versus the publishing side. No wrong answer. Well, there is wrong. There are wrong answers, but <laughs> go ahead. Um, you pay for the publisher's media. That's ac that's actually that's fifty percent right, and because you're fifty percent right, you get a prize. See, aren't you all feeling bad now? <laughs> Let's see. I got two books. I got Bold Brand from Josh Miles, a very good book, and then I've got Content Marketing by my good friend Rebecca Lieb. Which one would you like? There you go. Well, of course you do. Of course you want content marketing. <laughs> See, you didn't think there'd be prizes, right? It's what you get. Here's the difference. And you, and you talked about it a second ago. One, you pay for. It's actually a little bit more than that. It's how the money comes in. That's the difference. It's very important for you as business owners to understand this because the rules have changed. Actually, they, it's, they've, they've changed in our favor, believe it or not. If you are a publisher media company, 99% of your business model happens 
in two ways. One, somebody pays for that content. I want a subscription to Inc. Magazine. I will pay for that. I make my money as a publisher that way if I'm Inc. Magazine. I also make my money by people advertising in my magazine. So it's through sponsorship or paid content. That's, for the most part, that is the business model of a media company. If you create your own magazine, your own newsletter, uh, your own uh, ebooks that you offer, your own blog posts, all the same things that maybe Inc. Magazine creates, what's the purpose for you doing it? What's that? You drive sales, that's right. Drive, maintain sales and. Do you want a book? Sure. Okay. You already saw this presentation, though. Yeah, well, it was. <laughs> This is a good one. <laughs> See, she forgot already. <laughs> so it's really important to understand that, that we're on a level playing field now. Mm -hmm. And I'll get into more of that reason why. But the biggest issue is there are no technology barriers. You, me, the signposts, we can all create a blog, get it up and running in no time. It basically costs us nothing. And we are publishers. We have Facebook pages. We have Twitter accounts. We are publishing content all the time. It doesn't mean we're really good at it. It means that we are doing it. Um, so it's, but it's really important that we can reach and create our own audiences. And I'll talk about this a lot today. The, the key thing that will separate this working from you than not is the idea of you building your own audience. So it's the, it's, and I'll give you some tactics later about what you can do to grow that, but that's really key. So throughout the rest of the presentation, I want you to think, how do I build my own audience so people will rely on me for whatever information I have, and at the end of the day, they might want to buy more of your products and services because of it. So I want you to think about it this way. So let's start with SEO, search engine optimization. How many of you would like to get found in Google when your customers are searching for your products and services? I hope everybody raises your hand and say yes. Or maybe it's Bing. I don't know if you're, if you're a Bing lover or whatever. But SEO, you want to be found in Google, right? I want to drive leads online in some way. Or I want to use social media in some way that helps me in my business. That's mostly what we get. And by the way, we, we work with big, big billion dollar companies. And they all come in with the same issues. Hey, how do I get found in Google? How do I drive leads more effectively online? And how do I use Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest and LinkedIn? and uh, Instagram and Foursquare and everything else there is. How can we use these things to grow my business? And it starts right here. You can say storytelling. You can say content marketing. I don't care what you use. It starts with the information that you can use in these channels to do all these things. If you don't have good, compelling stories, good, amazing content, relevant content that's shareable, that people want to engage in, you can't do any of these things, or at least anything well. You can't game the system in Google anymore. I don't know how many of you have an SEO expert, but all those little, they call them gray hat or black hat tip things that you used to do, you can't do them anymore. Google's figured it out. What's the most important thing to being found in Google? It's content that is shared in social media. And then you do the basics of search. And I'll talk about some of that in a little bit as well. All right. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples of companies that I think are doing a very, very good job. And I'm going to start with this one that I think is a good example of trying. And here it is. So this very, very happy man is Jonathan Mildenhall. And Jonathan is, uh, for better or worse, his title is Chief Content Evangelist at Coca-Cola. Anybody see the movie Jerry Maguire? See the movie? OK, so you know the start of Jerry Maguire. You know, he wakes up in a sweat. and. He comes up with this epiphany that their sports agency needs less clients. Focus more, focus custom, more, more attention on each of their individual customers. It's very, very important. He writes, remember the blue memo that he writes? And he goes in there, and he puts them in everybody's mailbox, and then immediately gets fired because of it. So Jonathan Mildenhall did the same thing, but didn't get fired. He got promoted. Um, and he did it around this idea. And if you can see this at the top, it's called Coca-Cola Content 2020. Now, as a marketer, if you have any interest in marketing at all, I would just say here's a nice little homework assignment. This is on YouTube. Just type in Coca-Cola Content 2020 into Google. There's two videos. There's a seven-minute video and a 10-minute video. And Jonathan basically lays out Coca-Cola's 
content marketing strategy. They created this years ago. They put it on YouTube in August of 2011. And it's basically their Jerry Maguire mission statement about how they need to move from creative excellence or advertising to storytelling. And actually, this is a really good slide that says what they're trying to do. Why is this so important? Because Coca-Cola is the biggest vendor of advertising in the world, pretty much. And they spend money around the world. They sponsor the Olympics and everything else with whatever they do. And they're saying, look, we know that we're doing this, but we're not doing it right. There's a better way to do this. And by the way, advertising's not going away. But it doesn't work. It's not as effective as it used to be, especially for small business owners. So they're making this move, very, very important. Now, what happened a couple months ago is this. This is Coca-Cola Journey. I don't know if anybody gets the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. There was a big story on Coca-Cola's move into storytelling. And they talked about Coca-Cola Journey. And basically, what Coca-Cola is doing is they are creating stories that they feel would be of interest to Coca-Cola advocates uh, in some way, so that they're shared and talked about, shared on social media, and they start their whole purpose of doing is they want people to have an emotional connection with Coca-Cola so they drink more sugary water. I mean, really, that's what they want. <laughs> Hate to be that bland about it, but that's what they're trying to do. And they have four full-time people and 40 freelancers on this, creating content every day. So four full-time people. And you ask them, how many, John, they ask Jonathan, how much money do you spend on this? And they say, look, we're spending millions of dollars on this, but let's put it in perspective. We've got multi-billion dollar marketing budget. But they're still spending millions. So this is a really good start, I think, as what's to come. And if a company like Coca-Cola is doing this, I think as a small business, we have to look and say, hmm, this is kind of interesting what they're doing. So if you were to ask me, Joe, OK, that's great. I love the Coca-Cola example. Although I have no budget, what do I do? And I'm going to give you another big example of what I'm seeing. And I love this example. And it's, uh, it's Red Bull. I don't know if you see this. I don't know what it is about the sugary energy drink uh, <laughs> category or whatever, but it's uh, very powerful in the storytelling space. Red Bull Media House is a publishing company within Red Bull. Most people don't realize this. This is really interesting. And uh, here's my little quote uh, that I, I like to share. So, and I really do believe this. Red Bull is a media company that just happens to sell energy drinks. And I'm going to give you some examples of what they do. Anybody see the space jump guy? The guy that jumped from space, he had all the Red Bull gear on. You know who owns that content? Red Bull, absolutely. Do you know who got paid on all that syndication of that content, let alone the PR value of that? Red Bull. They sold that. They have a Red Bull content pool. Uh, where they basically sell their own con enthusiast content in video and pictures and text, and they sell it to traditional media. Anybody know? Did anybody know that? I just think that is fascinating. So they have Red Bull Content Pool. They have a record label. Anybody know about Red Bull Records, where they fund independent artists? They have the Red Bulletin, which is, by the way, one of the best digital magazines out there. So if any of you have an iPad and you want to uh, see a really good digital magazine. Red Bull has some amazing integrated video that they do. Here's an example of the um, digital magazine. And then they have, believe it or not, they still do print magazines in multiple countries around the world, talking about uh, enthusiast articles. And then I could spend all day on Red Bull. They have a TV station. They have multiple radio stations and a ton of other brands that I can't fit on this slide that are basically media brands. They are a media company. So here's my little prediction, and I'm often wrong with my predictions, but I would assume that Red Bull will move out of just the energy drink market in a, in a short period of time. I think you'll see them start to sell lots of other things, because what this so, so take this back to you, because you're thinking, I don't have Red Bull's budget. But what you do have is you have a customer base that you know and love. And what they've been able to do with their customer base, they own these media channels. That's the power of a media. Anybody work in media publishing? Any publishers here? The reason why it's such a compelling industry is because you have people that have opted in and say, yes, I would like to get your information. If you can do that, that's a very important emotional connection. And you can actually move product with that. And that's what they've been able to do. They, you have people that wake up and they, they live Red Bull. Every day they wear it, they, they pay attention to all their stuff, all these media channels. I'm not saying you have to do that, but that's what's possible today that wasn't possible five or six years ago. 
uh, before all this technology came around. All right, I'm going to share with you a little bit of research, and then I'm going to get into some case studies. And if you have any questions along the way, please let me know. So here's, we, we fund research every year, uh, Content Marketing Institute and Marketing Profs. Anybody go to Marketing Profs? No? OK, good, good organization, good partner organization of ours. We talked to over 2,000 marketers from North America, and we basically asked them questions about what they were doing in content marketing. So we first asked them, are you using content marketing? And this is the definition that you heard today. Are you creating content uh, in these kinds of channels to attract and retain customers? Are you doing that? 91% say yes. I don't know what the other 9% are doing. Uh, they're doing, <laughs> I guess they're doing traditional advertising. Whatever. And then, by the way, just again, keep this in mind. Just because you're doing content marketing doesn't mean you're doing it right. And I've got some good stats on that. Believe it or not, the average budget is 33%. Uh, so anywhere from large companies spend about 20%, small companies spend about 40%. Uh, and if you, if you really think hard about some of the things that you do, you might believe it. Most people don't believe that. But it's coming from a lot of different buckets and organizations. We'll go into a little bit later. And you don't have to squint your eyes, but I want you to see, I'm going to zoom in on this. But these are all the tactics that you're using. The average company does 12 of these tactics from a content standpoint. And I'll zoom in on them so you can get. But this is the one slide that, that when somebody says, no, I don't believe this, Joe, I say, yes. Bless you. I say, yes, absolutely, we are all publishers. And this is the proof. And I'll zoom in on it. So 87% are creating content specifically for social media channels, like you're creating photos for your Facebook page, or you're creating blog posts, or you're putting together e-newsletters. Uh, there's a couple key ones here. 78% have e-newsletters. That's across the board, small business, large business, doesn't matter. 77% 70, uh, have blogs. What's really funny about that stat is according to IBM, they say that 85% uh, of corporations, com non-media companies that have blogs, have five or less posts. I'll let that sink in a little bit, because it's really good <laughs> information. That means 85% of, of companies that have blogs have five or less posts. That means that we're really good at creating starting blogs, but not really good at the whole point of a blog and actually keeping content flowing through there. Uh, case studies, in-person events, 69%. By the way, in-person events are always rated the most effective content marketing initiative out of everything we've done in the last three years. Webinars, research reports, microsites, infographics, blah, blah, blah. By the way, if you would like, this is all free research. If you go to contentmarketinginstitute.com and just click on the research button, it's all free. Ungated, spread it around, it's all good stuff. There's B2B and B2C research. Uh, 50, oh, question, yes. I got a really good one. See, you knew this presentation, right? This is, it's coming up. It's coming right here. Hold on. I got it in two slides for you. 54% are increasing their budget in content marketing. I'm, I'm going to skip that slide. You can get it later. This is why we're here, and this is your question. Of all that, 91% are using content marketing, right? 54% are increasing their budget in this area, and only 36% feel they're effective at it. What's the definition of insanity, right? I mean, that's what I think about when I see this. Everybody's doing this, and they're spending more money on it, and it's not effective for them. This is a big problem. And a, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail in a second, but this makes a lot of sense to me because all of a sudden people said, oh, you're now a publisher. So anybody, I don't know if anybody's ever read The, the Now Revolution by Jay Bear. Anybody read Jay Bear stuff? Great, great author. Social, if you're into social media, it's a fantastic book. Jay's a good friend of mine, and Jay has always said this, and I really believe it. He says, every company today is in two businesses. You're in the business you're in, and you're in the publishing business. But nobody ever trained us that, to be in the publishing business. Nobody, like, uh, did you ever learn about it in school? Anybody get an MB, MBA? And t did, you, did you talk about publishing as your part of your MBA? A little bit. A very little bit, I bet. Yes. Nobody taught us how to do this. So you have all these companies, and you have all these publishing tools that have been unleashed on us, and nobody ever taught us how to tell a good story, and why to tell a good story, and the different tactics to do that, and the strategy behind it. So that's why we're seeing this number. We have a huge education gap. 
most marketing departments that we deal with, and if we go into some of these huge, huge companies, they have whole marketing department. We, we did a workshop the other day for 75 marketers in one company. And very set up very traditionally. They're trying to figure out how they can take this publishing model on, but none of them have ever been trained in it. And they said, oh, no, no, now you've got to publish your blog, you've got to do ebooks and white papers, and we want to do our own events, and we're going to do our own uh, digital magazine, and you've got to figure all this out. We've never done it before, and that's why we're, we're having this issue. If we ask them, what are their biggest challenges? This is what really makes me sad, actually. This used to be the number one challenge, producing the kind of content that engages my customers. It's a very hard thing. How do I tell stories that compel my customers to do something? That, for the first two years, this was the biggest challenge. For this year, it changed to producing enough content, which is very, very scary. Because what's happened is, and this, when you go into a company and they start talking about content marketing and content creation, they, uh, they say, oh, I want to do a blog. Uh, we need to, what are we going to do on Facebook? Uh, what are we going to do on, oh, the Pinterest is out. What are we going to do there? And they said, we need to produce more content. And that's never, not one time has producing enough content ever been the real problem. But it always is believed to be the real problem because we have all these channels to fill. But what happens is none of those people actually start with a strategy. They're just doing very tactical things. I'll get into that in a second. Um, and I call this the problem with what. So what happens is they'll say, anybody ever been to the site, American Express Open Forum? Small businesses, I mean, I would imagine most of you would, would go there. Uh, this is their content marketing initiative. Basically, they sell more, they get more credit card signups for open through this media site than anything else that they do. And this is, a, this is just like an Inc.com. It's the same type of thing. They're trying to solve challenges uh, of their customers, and they're trying to get people to take an action on their site. But, but I get customers that come to say, Joe, we want to do this, just like American Express does. Can you help us do that? Or they'll say, oh, I love Starbucks Twitter strategy from a content standpoint and an engagement standpoint. Can, we want to do that. Can you show us how to do that? Or they'll say, this, by the way, this is, my, <laughs> this is my Pinterest board dedicated to the color orange. It has no business purpose at all. It's just I, I have an infatuation with the color orange. But they say, Joe, Pinterest, what are we going to do? And believe it or not, you get B2B manufacturers on there that say, what are we going to do on Pinterest? I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, seriously? If you're retail, I can, I can get that. But this is the kind of focus we have because we're so channel focused and we end up asking the wrong question. So what I would want you to get out of here, and this is hopefully one thing that you will get out of this, and it's very, very important. I want you to look at the channels that you're in right now because you're all in multiple channels. If the average company, the average small business is engaged in 10 activities, 10 content activities. So what I want you to do is list those and say, okay, we're on Facebook, we've got a blog, we've got a newsletter, um, we're doing uh, white papers, whatever you're doing, I want you to list them. And I want you to ask yourself why. Not that it's wrong. But I want to ask yourself why, so that you can really go back to the beginning and figure out what the strategy is for you being in that channel and what kind of content you need to hit your goals. So I want you to think about it this way. We go back to the beginning. Go back to your three big goals. I want to be found in Google. I want to figure out social media. I want to drive leads online in one way, shape, or form. And I want you to figure out that why, and I call that a content marketing mission statement. So think about it this way. If I'm Inc. Magazine, I'm using Inc. Magazine because anybody read Inc. Magazine? I love Inc. Magazine. I, I get excited when it comes in the mail. <laughs> That's how weird I am. So Inc. Magazine comes in there. They have what they would call an editorial mission. For you, it would be a content marketing mission statement because you're a content marketer. For them, they're a publisher, a media company. They have an editorial mission. I can tell you what their editorial mission is. It's that they are creating a consistent, pieces of valuable content targeted at small businesses and entrepreneurs in order for them to be more profitable. In a nutshell, that's their content marketing mission. That's why they create content in the first place. So what I need you to do is, you have to ask yourself that same question. Why are you creating content at all? There's two things. What are the informational needs of your customers? What are their pain points? I always like to say, what keeps your customers up at night? 
Those are the questions that you probably need to be answering to position yourself as a thought leader, as an expert. And then at the same time, you have to figure out how you're going to move the business. So I call that your, your secret sauce. It's their needs mixed with your needs. And what that meets in the middle, that's your content marketing mission statement. You have a little bit different than Inc. Inc. has to just create really good content because if they get your attention, they can get people to sponsor that, like Google and Lincoln Financial and American Express and whatnot. You have to actually move products and services. So you have a little bit different way to go. So the best way to think about it is, what if you were the leading publisher, the leading trade magazine in your niche? How would you act different? Does it even matter? Most of the content that we create as small businesses is probably about us. It's probably about our products, it's our services, uh, maybe some awards we get. Anybody uses press releases, you're sending out press releases that nobody's paying attention to, which is fine. But you gotta, we got to realize today, you know, customers don't care about us, they don't care about our products, they don't care about our services. They all care about themselves. So how do you get their attention? You have to talk about things that they care about that are really helpful, 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 helpful to them. So I always said, when we work with companies, we always kind of go through this exercise of, what if you were a media company? How would you market different? And I think that's the present and the future of how we need to market as small businesses. All right. Did anybody get a couple things out of that? Am I keeping you awake? All right. OK. Any questions before we go on to some of these case studies? Good? All right. What's the difference between content marketing and being a thought leader? Thought leadership is one piece of content marketing. There's lots of different pieces of content. If you are moving your buyer, like especially, are you B2B or B2C? B2B, very good. So if you look at your funnel, right? You look at attention at the top and then your conversion and then you have, I call it a content marketing funnel. So you have the funnel at the top, attention at the top, you have a conversion, they actually bought something and then you have an ongoing relationship with them. There's pieces of that that will move them down that funnel that are thought leadership related. There's some that is not. There's some that's just helpful content along the way to move them along the process. Honestly, I don't care if you know the difference or not. I just want you to figure out what your strategy is and how you use it. A lot of people will say, oh. Buzzword a couple of years ago, being the thought leader in it, your industry. Exactly. Thought, and, but there's all different pieces of content that you don't have to be a thought leader to move to take your customers where you need them to go for your business. For example, there's a lot of cases you might need to really focus on entertaining and not informational content. I believe the best content is both informational and entertaining. Entertaining content doesn't really have anything to do with being a thought leader. That's more informational. But there's really two ways to go, informational, entertaining, or my favorite, both. So that's really the way that I would, I would put it. Good, it's a very, very good question. All right, so we are going to go through some examples. I'm going to talk about some trends that I've, I've been seeing, uh, and then Start with some big companies, and then I'm going to end with the smallest of small companies, us. And I'm going to share some examples about what we've done uh, with literally no budget. And I think you could take some of these and really use them for your business. So the first trend is this idea of the content platform. This is kind of the buzzword in the industry. Whether it's a blog or whether it's a WordPress site or whatever the case is, you're seeing a lot of companies say, I need a platform. And America, so if you think about what a platform is, just like American Express Open Forum is their platform for small businesses. Inc.com is Inc's platform for everything else that they do. Or you might say their magazine, their print magazine could be their platform as well. Let me give you some examples. This first one, this is Homemade Simple. Anybody know who develops this site? Just take a look at it. Give me, give me some, for those of you who haven't seen this presentation before, um, who, if you look at this, what, I'm sorry. That's actually, that's a really good guess. Pillsbury, give me another one. Craft, another good one. Anything? I'm sorry? Martha Stewart, Meredith, very, very good. Those are, actually, that's a really, that's the first time I've had that kind of. Uh, most of the time, it's hey, is it, is it real simple? Is it Meredith? Is it Martha Stewart? They think this is a media company. It's actually Procter and Gamble. So Procter and Gamble developed HomemadeSimple.com back in 2003. So this is obviously not a very new site, but they, they were targeting women who had jobs, who have kids at home, who are trying to keep everything together. Uh, moms on the go, recipes, uh, 
how do I keep the house organized because my husband doesn't do anything? I mean, those types of con that type of content is on here. And believe it or not, I don't know what the latest numbers in, but last I checked, they had over 10 million people signed up to get regular updates from the site. You know what that tells me? That means there's 10 million people that raised their hand and said, yes, I would like to receive marketing information from Procter & Gamble. It's exactly what they've said. And why do they do that? Because it's incredibly helpful to them. So I want to take it back to that content marketing mission statement because it's really important because what I want you to get out of this is you to think about what your content marketing mission statement would be. So this is their content marketing mission statement. Enabling women to have more quality time with their families. That's their goal. Why is that important and how does that matter in the content that I create? Well, if somebody in the editorial department comes up with an idea and says, let's do one on uh, targeted for dads and why they need to think about uh, putting a home office uh, so they can be more helpful at home, whatever the case is. If I'm the editorial director, I'm saying, no, can't do that because that's not in line with their editorial mission. So the point is, if you don't have one of these, how do you know which content's going to work and what's not? You don't. That's, and that's why we're seeing all, oh, let's put that on Facebook. That cartoon would be funny. People will like that. Let's put that on. And, we can, and you see it all, see your stream? You see the businesses that put <laughs> some really stupid things on their stream that have no purpose there? Because they don't have one of these. They don't have a strategy behind it. All right, so there's one example. Let me give you another one from Procter & Gamble. This is beinggirl.com, and I have to be honest, I don't spend a lot of time on this site. And actually, I have, um, I have two boys, 9 and 11. And some of the sections of this site really scare me. So I, I didn't even click through on, on a couple of these, because uh, I don't know what they are. But this is beinggirl.com. And they have, I mean, they're, they have a mission statement as well. And what is that mission statement? And it's this. Enabling teen girls to be more confident with their sexuality. I do have to say, though, I had somebody come up to me the other day and say, don't use sexuality, say bodies. That's the ignorant man in me. I will. I need to change this to bodies. But this is basically that is their mission statement. All right. And by the way, Forrester did an independent study on this site and said that this site was four times more effective from a campaign standpoint than any other campaign they've ever run from an advertising standpoint, because it was basically talking about content that was helpful to teen girls. Was that's, that still Procter and Gamble? that's still Procter and Gamble. These are all Procter and Gamble. Good old Cincinnati company. So here's another one. So this is one that's more me. This is targeted right at me. Man of the house. I mean, if you look at some of these articles, here's, here's five weird facts about your wife's brain. I mean, I'm looking at that. I'm clicking right on that. I'm like, <laughs> that is for me. I want to know. I want to know. <laughs> Almost 15 years. No, I don't know. <laughs> so anybody want to know what their uh, mission statement is? Here it is. <laughs> a couple things about this site. First of all, I know your women are all saying, that's an impossible goal. It's, it can't be done, which is one of the reasons why this site doesn't exist anymore. They, they, they killed it, which because I think they had an unrealistic content marketing mission statement. Can't do it. I think that's kind of funny. but. But that's the point. So you get the idea? That's what we're thinking of. So this is one company targeting buyers in different ways, and that's the challenge. If you're a small business, you probably don't have your buyers set up in different content buckets. But as you become more advanced, you get companies like Procter & Gamble that will say, oh, I've got a CFO here. I've got a CMO here. I've got a mom here. I've got a young kid here. All those are different audiences, and they all need different channels. Which, by the way, this is why this is going to get really sticky and scary and really difficult for a lot of people. But for right now, what I would say, if you're not doing any of this, focus on your core buyer. Who is it? Is it a, is it a, uh, is it a director of operations? Is it a mom? Is it a dad? Really come to grips with who that is and get personal with it. Do they like to hang out at the coffee shop? What time do they get up? Those, that's a, what a, what's called a buyer persona. You really get a good feeling about who your buyer is so that you can figure out from an informational standpoint the kind of content that they would need. Hey, Joe? Yes? So how prevalent was their actual brand on these sites? 
I, they, actually not very. If you scroll all the way down, you'll see it at the bottom. And I uh, personally, I think it's a mistake. Would you say how they monetize the value of all this work they're putting in? If, they didn't if you go, like, I'll give you an example. Go to Homemade Simple. When they, when they send the recipes out, those recipes always contain something Procter & Gamble related. Or when they had messes, they always said, you know, go use Swiffer or whatever. So, so they would, it was more product placement. That's, but what I don't like about this, I don't think it's full transparency. To be honest with you, I like what American Express does. Because if you're going to be a thought leader, be a thought leader. Be a, say, this is from us. And I think what they're, we're, we're moving out of the advertorial age. Actually, we're, that's a whole other issue. We could have a whole other uh, session just on advertorial and some of the issues with sponsored content online and the things that we're seeing. Um, but what I want to do for my company is I want to get my brand. I want let, to let people know this is from me. This is from our brand. And we want you to know that it's us, and you don't want to hide it anymore. And I think that uh, we're at that point where companies are OK with that. I mean, they, you know, most, most consumers don't trust the media. They don't trust brands either. They don't trust anybody. So it really doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. OK, good question. I'm going to talk about story explosion. Um, so I'm going to take it down a notch. So Procter & Gamble, big, big company, top 50. And we're going to take it out of Kelly Services, Fortune 500 company. Then we're going to get much smaller. Anybody know Kelly Services? Anybody know the Kelly girl? So this is Kelly Services' big outsourcing group, B2B, long sales cycle, uh, big outsource workforce solutions. And Todd Wheatland runs the content and social media for Kelly and says, look, we don't have, they have three people. So big company, they have three people working in their group. Says, I can't do blogs every day. I can't do all this. I don't have the resources for that. We've got to be very responsible with how we use our budget. This is their website. It looks like a content site, right? I mean, there's a, this is all content. They're just, that's the way that they go. They're, their whole goal is to really educate first, begin a relationship through their content, and then sell them after. So here's their approach. And this is really critical because most people do it backwards. So if you can do it a little bit this way and take a little advice from what Kelly's doing, it's fantastic. They have five key topic areas that they focus on that they've registered as pain points for their target. They have three main buyer personas. I think HR director, uh, CEO, and another level. CFO, I think. So what they want to do is every story idea they come up with, they want to create at least 20 pieces of content. What most of us do is we'll create a blog post and we'll say, hey, that blog post or that white paper performed really well. Let's reuse that. Let's take a bit and put it on Facebook. Let's put this on Twitter. Let's take an image and put it on Pinterest or SlideShare, whatever the case is. That's the wrong way to do it. What we want to do is we want to plan ahead of time. This is the right way to do it. They have a story idea, and you want to think about your what's called a channel strategy ahead of time. So that means I have my story, and let's go to their story. Their story is on talent mobility. They're going to talk about what the issue of talent mobility and what it means to your company and what you need to do about it, which is completely boring to me, but I'm sure somebody thinks that's fantastic and exciting. So that's talent mobility. That's what they're talking about. And what we want to think about is right now we have 20 channels. They have 20 channels. How, what's the content going to be for each of those channels? So for example, what are we going to do on? So here's what we're going to do our PDF, our ebook. And most companies just do an ebook. You know, ebook is like a, a sexy white paper, for those of you who don't know what an ebook is. So here's an ebook. And we're going to put it on. SlideShare, and here's what we're going to do on Pinterest with a nice infographic. And then we've got different white papers for our different buyers. So this one's on the future of work. And then we've got, we're going to pull out content from here and put these different ones together for those buyer buyers and on and on and on. So think about it ahead of time. Most of us don't do that. So the, very simply, as you're doing, so let's say, any, how many of you have blogs? So like 20 of you have blogs. So what I want you to think of, when you think about putting your blog post together, I want you to think about, how are we going to use this in our e-newsletter? And how am I going to use this on Facebook? And how are we going to use this on Twitter? It doesn't take that much. Just ask the question. And you'll be much smarter with how you deliver that content ongoing. By the way, the one really cool thing about what they do is that every time they do a project, they commission a local artist to do all this. And they take, a digital, they take digital images of their um, 
of their designs and they use them throughout their ebooks, which I just think is fantastic. That's a, has nothing to do with anything. I just think it's cool and how they do it. Because I, I mean, a lot of you use like big stock photo or i stock photo or those types of things. Really, you find a local designer and put some stuff together. It really doesn't cost that much to do. All right. I'm going to talk about the idea of the chief storyteller. This is important for you, depending on how. Even, let's say it's just you or you have a small group of people. You need these roles. These are not positions. I'm not saying go and hire a chief content officer. I'm saying you need somebody to fill these roles regardless. And honestly, if you are a solopreneur, they might all be you. Because when I started in 2007, these were all me. So as you get bigger, you can kind of figure out how you're going to do it. Chief content officer, this is the person that sets the strategy. Who, who is in charge of the content strategy? That's the chief content officer. Who reports into that? Managing editor. A managing editor is half project manager, half really good storyteller. Most important person in the marketing department right now, in my opinion. Can't get enough managing editors. It's so critical. Then you have content producers. Those are the people that are making it look sexy from an online standpoint, offline, in print, whatever. Those are your awesome designers. Then you have chief listening officers. This could be in a small company you have a, or a big company. You have a social media manager. These are your chief listening officers. What happens when you send out a piece of content? You get some kind of, hopefully, you don't hear silence. Hopefully, you get some kind of reaction. What do you do with that reaction? What? Chief listening officer gets to say, oh, I got to route that to product marketing, or I got to route that to the CEO, or somebody's got to do something in customer service about this. Or you'll say, Oh, that was a really good idea we got from that customer. We need to change our strategy. I need to get that to the chief content officer. So we're going to root that back. Yes? So you're saying your listening officer is your, somebody who's listening to your inbound reaction, not your, like, yeah, the re the, what we're, yeah, what we're so, so when you send out a piece of content in a perfect world, there is a reaction to that. You're going to get sharing. Response. The response to that, you're going to have comments on a blog, you're going to have comments on LinkedIn page, whatever the case is, depending on your strategy. You need somebody that's listening to that. Could be listening on Twitter through hashtags, uh, listening um, to search phrases, maybe using Google Alerts. If you're big enough and you have a reputation management system, fantastic. I don't, you know, we're not big enough to have one, but Google Alerts is fantastic. So using all those tools as your content goes out so that you can do something with it and evolve. Because once you create a content strategy of some kind, you change it the next day, and the next day, and every day it changes and evolves. And then you have content creators. So who's going to create all this content? Who's going to do this? Well, it could be all these people, and it could be none of them. It could be your employees. It could be your customers. It could be influencers in the industry. It could be freelancers. It could be an agency, anything. It could be all of them. Why is this important? This is really, really important for big, big companies. But if you even have different departments, like if you have a PR agency that you work with, or you have a social media group, what happens is everyone in each of those departments are creating content, and all of them feel they own content. To some degree, they're right. They do. But what happens is they don't talk to each other. So all I'm saying for you is if you have a PR group or an agency or people in your own company creating content, you've got to get them together on a regular basis. Because what happens in most companies is you have duplicated work. And it's not really working at all. <laughs> right. So Todd, as I talked about in Kelly Services, that's an example of a chief content officer. And Rob Yogel, what I use as content marketing director at Monetate, B2B technology company, I use this because he got picked off from a traditional publisher. And he was. And we're seeing that a lot. So I, when I go and give talks to journalism majors, um, they're usually very depressed. So they're like, there's no jobs in media anymore. And what I tell them is, there's never been a better time to be a journalism major. It's just that the jobs are on the brand side. They're not on the media side. So I said, if you are willing to go to the dark side, <laughs> then there's, pl there's plenty of opportunity. Um, but there is. There was, uh, this, is, this just happened. There was a IT, big IT media company that let go of 13 journalists. Gave them the notice. They all let them go. And within two weeks, they were all hired by the, one of the biggest technology companies in the world. The CMO for that technology company called the publisher and thanked them. <laughs> and we are seeing that a lot. 
Because there's no, by the way, there's nothing wrong with the media. Uh, you know, there's, if you look at even the print media, I see samples all the time of print still being engaged in. The problem is nobody's spending money on advertising. That's the problem. The business model is broke. The engagement we're engaging in, I always like the TV stats. People say, nobody watches TV anymore. People are watching more TV. They're just spread out. They're just not watching network TV anymore. They're watching uh, Duck Dynasty or something like that, <laughs> which, by the way, is a fantastic show. It's the only one I watch. I got two more examples. So when we're getting down smaller in size. We're getting some ideas. Um, how, many of you, how many of you have employees that create content for you in some way? OK, you're the only one that lets your employees <laughs> create content. Most companies get very nervous about their employees creating content of, of some kind. Uh, what I would contend with is your best marketers are your employees, or can be your best employees, but they need training. And I'm going to show you an example of one company that did it very, very well. OpenView Venture Partners is a VC comp small VC company out of Boston. And basically, they're targeting tech, small technology companies that need funding and want to grow. Uh, back in 2009, I talked to Scott Maxwell, the CEO. And he, he read my book, and he says, Joe, we're not doing any of this stuff. We're not sharing any of this content. But we have all this expertise on staff. You know, what do we do? I said, well, let, I don't know. Let's figure it out. Let's go through it. And we did an audit, and we found out, started with what was their mission, just like we want you to do. So I said, what's their content marketing mission? The mission is to produce ideas and inspiration that help our readers build great companies. Sounds a lot like Inc. Magazine, right? But it's the same type of thing. That's what they're going after. So they started that with the mission. And they said, OK, great. We don't have any content. But they realized they had all the assets in place. And those assets were their employees. So what normally would happen is if a portfolio company or portfolio prospect calls in, and says, I have a question, where do they go? They go to one of those employees. And then once, if you had a question, you'd, let's say that I was the advisor, I would answer your question, and poof, that would be done. Hopefully, you'd answer your question, but there's no more content. There's nothing there. Nothing was recorded. There was no sharing of that content. And that could have been a missed opportunity. So what they did is they started with some employees that got social media a little bit wanted to blog, were a little bit of ex excited about it. And they said, look, this is what we're going to do. And put together that plan and said you know, to each expertise area, OK, you're an expert in operations. Let's figure out what your content strategy would be. And you're an expert in marketing, so let's figure out what your content strategy would be. They did a beautiful thing. And this is they did it right, what so many other companies do wrong. Most employee content programs that are created, they, they say, OK, we need it by this date. We need it in this format and um, get it to us. And no training or nothing. They just said, OK, can you do it? And we want it. And, and most people are actually not very good writers. So they're very scared. They don't know how to do it. And they end up not doing it at all. Like, I don't want to do that. Too much work. So what, um, what OpenView did was fantastic is they actually hired an editor. And their job was to extract the expertise from those people however they could get it. Email back and forth, that's fine. You want to do it on a recorded call, that's fine. You want to do it on a video face-to-face, -face? that's fine. You want to write it yourself and just do bullet points for me, that's fine too. Get the raw content, the raw material. That's where editing is so important, because anybody can get raw content, but editing makes it come to life. That really tells the story. So that's what they did. And these people loved it, because they said, however they were used to giving content, they gave that content and put it together in format that somebody knew how to write for SEO and knew how to put it on the blog. And they had somebody put pictures with it. They weren't all responsible for getting it done. Created this, the OpenView blog. And then that transformed into ta -da, their platform, OpenView Labs, which has over 1,000 pieces of audio, video, textual content, 90% of which is created by employees. They put together a video studio and a podcast studio in one of their spare office areas because they thought it was so important to get done. In 18 months, traffic just went through the roof. Um, they have, I think now, this, is, so this has been going on for about two plus years now. They have over 15,000 people signed up to get regular updates from them. This is the beauty. So this is the beautiful part. 
their sales cycle was 12 to 18 months when they would make contact with a portfolio company and getting that sold and through. It, it lowered to three to six months. So you B2B companies, you know that's astronaut, this doesn't happen. Well, what happened? Well, when a entrepreneur that wanted money, that needed support, they, they went and contacted OpenView, which all, that's all that happens. They don't have to worry about a lot of those referrals anymore. They would just reach out because they were reading all this stuff and when they were ready to go and say, look, I want to go get money out, who do I turn to? They would just contact OpenView. And why not? Because they were giving them all their wonderful answers already. So now the great part is, is OpenView can choose who they want. They have more to choose from and they don't have to go out traditionally and find that anymore. And that 15,000 plus that gets their newsletter, that's their lead funnel. That's how they're getting it. And by the way, hardly spent a dime on it hardly spent any one of us here, and you're, I know a lot of us are struggling with budgets, any one of us could have afforded that program. Go ahead. So how did these, these 15,000 people find this? What happens is, there's, actually what I'll do is I'll share something a little bit about social media, going out to social media, which is really important. The first six months, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I started my blog in April 26 of 2007, the first six months, the only person that read my blog was my mom, and she had no idea what I did, and it was crickets. You really have to work it. It takes time. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And that's why I say 18 months. First six to nine months, somebody would have said this program was a failure because you're just starting. No, you have no credibility. Nobody knows. They have nobody signed up. Uh, you have no social media traction because you weren't putting out really good content for people to want to connect with you, fan or follow you, so they had to start from scratch. So I'll share with you some of the things that we did. They're similar to um, what they did, and basically they reached out to influencers in the industry to start to magnify what they were already doing, and I'll share that in a second, but it's a really good point, because that's what you have to do kind of to start out with. All right, so this is, I'm gonna end up with this one, and this is all our case study. So this is, uh, our little case study and what we've done, uh, like I said, I started the business in um, April, April 2nd, 2007, and it was just me. And had uh, two nickels to rub together, and that was about it. And I was, had an idea, and I'm like, what the heck am I gonna, I was like, oh my God, I better go back to my real job because this is not going to work. But I had the idea that, this was what we're talking about. Boy, if I can focus on a niche and I can really, um, give away amazing information and spread it around the community, uh, we can make this thing work. So what I'm gonna do is share how, how we did it. Uh, we've been very, very successful. We made the Inc. 500 last year. Uh, we, were, we just got fastest growing startup in Northeast Ohio, which was very cool. And, I've, and over that six years, we spent less than $50,000 in advertising. So what we've done here is all content creation. Go ahead. Uh, this whole idea about Mm -hmm. knowledge. Yep. Uh, how does that fit into this, or what's your philosophy? Is, that, is this considered free consulting? I did a presentation at South by Southwest last year on content marketing for consulting because consultants are scared to death of this because they'll say, I'm not going to give away my secret sauce because they're gonna, then they're going to read my stuff and they're not going to hire us. And this is my case to them. I'm like, if somebody reads a couple blog posts of yours and then doesn't hire you, you did not want that business. I can guarantee you that. I will take that chance on losing one or two customers possibly to grow that out 100, 200, 500, 1,000 times reach. You just cannot get that reach by keeping that in. I believe that communications is our only competitive advantage today. So if you can get out in front of the other consultants, they'll really be helpful. Well, it's because what happens is the people that hire a consultant, they really don't want to do the work themselves. They really want to find out, okay, do you really know your stuff? And if you know your stuff, then I'll, I have the confidence to hire you just like OpenView. Same type of thing. It will happen, uh, but we, because we have a consultant, we have 10% of our business is consulting. But if somebody reads five or six of our blog posts and then decides not to do business with us, that's great, because I did not want to get contacted by them. That's, that's not the kind of business that we want. So that's kind of the input. Yes, there will be times, but I think the benefits far outweigh uh, so the negative. I think that people who are looking for somebody doing their services, 
they read this one, they read somebody else, or, and maybe even call to find out how much your services are, and then they go someplace else. That's they, all right. They, they learn a lot as a result of reading your stuff. That, and I'm happy for them. Okay. That's, fan, that's fantastic. I always believe in my heart that that is not business that we would have wanted anyways okay. if they're trying to go that way. I want the people that, like if I'm, we, we, a couple years ago I, I had a, another business called Social Tract and we did blogging for uh, HVAC contractors because they didn't, you know, they were in a truck all day, they didn't want to do it themselves and so we created a lot of that content for them and that was the biggest issue too. It's like, well, what if we, you know, tell them how to fix this and they don't do it themselves. I'm like, actually, you probably want them to because they'll get to a point where this is too complicated. It's if it's just changing a filter, just tell them how to change a filter. But if it's really that general maintenance and tune-up, they're not going to do it themselves. And if they do, that's not really the kind of customer that you want. It's a good question. So I'm going to share kind of the way that we did it and uh, the way that we still do it. And I think that this is probably applicable to any of you. You could use this in your industries. Um, the way we started, we had 95% of the content that we create on our site is done by other people. They're done by contributors. So we have about 150 contributors. Every 7 o'clock, every morning, every day, we post a blog post. Um, what's really What's really critical in this process is, and here's an example. So Jonathan Crossfield, Australia is one of our target. We have a, an event coming up in a few weeks in Australia. That's our secondary target is Asia Pacific. So I got Jonathan Crossfield from Asia. That's one of our influencers there. And he's creating a piece of content. Jonathan's a great writer. But I can guarantee you when we got that, that content was in bad shape. And it, even really good writers that come through our editorial, it's not really, it's raw content. It's not great. It's not in SEO shape. It's not in social shape. We've really got to take it to the next level. So what Jonathan does, turns it in. We have one editor that runs through it and one proofreader. They really, I mean, if, if you would look at the Word documents that we see coming through, it's, it's like red line strike out hell. It's really horrible what we see. Because even my own is, I think I'm a good writer, and they just trash whatever I do. But why is this so important? I want Jonathan to share this article. I want this to be so good that Jonathan shares the content. Well, why does that matter? I know my network. You all have your own networks. You have your own databases. You have your own customers. You know your network, right? Great, you've got them. But, but if you're going to grow your business, you need to get beyond your network. I want Jonathan's network. And I want Jonathan's network, network to share that so that we can expand our reach. That's the only way we're going to do it. And that's why we like the influence. That's why we're going to get more contributors in. And this is why we picked this strategy. Because if we wanted to go as big as possible, we have to go and partner with as many people as possible. And I think, by the way, you can do this in any industry right now. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions on that, let me know. OK, calls to action. Remember we talked about owned media being critical? How does this whole thing work for us? We have one call to action on every content page we have. It's this big box, and that same box is down at the bottom of this article if you scroll down. It's give me your email address, and I'll give you really lots, a ton of value every day, or if you want to sign up weekly, if you want it daily or weekly. I need to make that connection with them, and they have to sign up to that. Because if I, if I get, come there and they, I lose them, I, I've lost an opportunity. So I want to make sure that they sign up so that I can start to own that media channel with them and that relationship. This is a pop-up. This overlays our website. Um, the, we use Pippity. Anybody use a WordPress site? WordPress? Is, OK, so this is this, Pippity works with WordPress. It's a pop-up technology. As a user, as a person who scrolls through the internet, I loathe pop-ups. Anybody like pop-ups? No. But you know what? Pop-ups work really really well. Over 50% of our signups every day come through this pop-up. What we do is we give them a really good piece of content. Hey, we're going to give you this 100 content marketing examples. If you sign up, we promise we won't spam you, spam you and we're going to send you uh, a daily article or a weekly article depending on how you sign up. And what we've been able to do in really about two and a half years is grow this list. It's just We just hit over the 40,000 number just from that. And they're all signed in. This is, 
So this is what's really important because because people ask me, well, I want like, I want fans, I want likes, I want followers, and I'm gr I say great. There's, you're building your digital footprint. I want you to have all those, but those are owned by LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. If Twitter wants to tomorrow, they could turn that off, and you've lost all your followers. Done. But I. If for this strategy, this is an owned media strategy. I own that database. That's why it's critical. I think email is the, it gets a bad rap. Uh, that email database is so, so critical. So that's why we focus every call to action on the email. Yes? So you're producing a piece of content every day for the blog. Yes. There. You're offering them to this pop-up, 100 examples. Yep. And that's kind of like an autoresponder. So it's pushing it out automatically. Yeah, it's RSS feed through. We use MailChimp right now, but yes. Is there any other auto onboarding kind of approach? You mentioned that you know one other newsletter that comes once a day kind of thing. Uh, from a, like an automated. Yeah, automated system, or is it you just? We we're just so so you know where we're at right now. We're actually looking at changing from MailChimp to something a little bit marketing marketing automation light tools like uh, Infusionsoft, Exact Target. Uh, we've even looked at Marketo, Eloqua, those types of things. That's kind of where we're at right now. But no automation beyond that. But what we're trying to do, the next step for this is when you sign up and we have a whole getting started section yeah. where you, you sign up to getting started. And then for you know a couple weeks, you'll be sent, take this step and this step. Yeah, we're, we're not there. We don't do that yet. But that's kind of the idea to do that. We're going to test that out and see if that works. So right now, it's really simple. It's you sign up, you get a weekly newsletter, you get a daily newsletter, and that's it. Yeah, go ahead. No, so we we have it. So the question is, um, yeah, the the question is, it could be, could it be quite expensive? I'll tell you exactly what we spend. So we have in our Mailchimp database. We have, I think, the 70,000 to 100,000 name bunch because we, right. we have 40,000 opt in, but we've got a promo database and other things that we do. I think every month we spend uh, $470, something like that, which is unbelievable because I remember what we used to spend in Penton, and it's just like, oh my gosh. That's why all this is, is and, it, and, it's autom and it's automatic. We set it, we, set it, we, we, put, we publish at 7 a.m. every morning, and at 10 on the dot, 10 Eastern every time you will get an RSS feed that'll say, oh, here's yeah. the article of the day. Done. I do. That yeah. department is really small. Like, so. <laughs> what, what, uh, what? Just a very, like, from campaigns. Oh, OK. Um, to work in campaigns, which is the <coughs> budget to, I have a Got couple it. trainers or just that trying to reach. So it's very, it's very, very feasible for, you know, for anyone to do this kind of thing. So we, so pop up, because we're focusing on email. So I'm big on subscribers. That's a whole book is about, how to really grow your subscribers, because I think it's the key to uh, especially small business. OK, here's your question. So this is when we started in 2007 and started the blog, and nobody's paying attention to us. How did we go from you know, nobody, no audience to, I just checked today because I wanted to have the stats. We had 161,000 visitors in the last 30-day period come to our website. So get, now put in the think about the idea of spent less than 50,000 in advertising that whole time because I want to sink this in this actually really does work. How did we do this? We I'm sorry. Oh, question. Yes, please go ahead. Yell it out. Mhm. Mm uh cost you mean cost per thousand from a from a media standpoint? I actually, I mean so for those of you that don't know cost per thousand, and I, I want to make sure I'm using this in the right way that you're thinking of it. Like when we sell, like we will sell advertising sometime on our site, because sometimes we sell sponsorship. And, and generally in the consumer side, it's done on a CPM basis. They'll say, oh, I want 1,000 impressions, uh, and I'm going to spend $30 for that 1,000 impressions. Is that kind of what you're thinking about? Yeah. Got it. And you're buying, and I'm talking in terms of small media. Yes. So I'm trying to understand how to relate traditional media measurement to social media measurement. Okay. I probably wouldn't uh, because there's. 
there's different measurements that I think you should look at for this one. So I'll tell you, so let's just look at this. Your, your, Okay. Yeah. So let, let's just take, yeah, there's all kinds of things. You could do eye tracking, you could do a lot of different things. Here's what I look at. I look at every day with the type of content, because we do it on a per post basis. So let's just look at it in the morning. I send out a piece of content. How does that content perform? What does performance mean to that? How many shares did it have total on Facebook, LinkedIn, whatnot? Good. That's one. That's those are called those are user indicators. They are sharing social sharing indicators. That's one thing that I'll look at. Then I want to look at how is that doing in search? Because every one of those articles that we send out is attached to a keyword phrase. So let's say for example, let me go back to the example and show this one. Uh, content marketing leads. Content marketing leads. I can tell you right now was the phrase for this one. And it probably probably mentioned it a couple times coming up here about content marketing leads. And what we'll do over a 30-day period is we'll look at where we're at in content marketing leads and did this article help us get up. So I'm looking at it from a search standpoint, traffic going to the site. Every we look at the site as a whole, I said 161,000 visitors, but I want to look individually on each one of those do do, and you can do that simply in Google Analytics. Set up Google Analytics, you can track every one of those. Then what I want to do is, and this is where we're at right now, we're trying to figure out and make sure we get it per post because I want to know how each of the contributors perform because I want to, the ones that really perform well, I want to have them come back and do more. I want to know how many signups came through, which is weird because a lot of times people will click on multiple things, they'll come back two or three times before they sign up. But really I want to make sure every day we're increasing our signups. And technically, if you just use basic math, as our user, if, we're, if, we, if everything stays the same, as our users increase, we should be increasing the amount of signups, and we're testing that every day. So, at, so I don't even look at anything related to traditional measurements like CPM, because what I want to look at is, what is my database? And what we've seen in social, most people don't get this. Most people think social starts with you know, Facebook and Twitter and everything else. You know what social starts with? Email. Email is the steroids, because when we look at our sharing stats, we'll go on the site, yeah, they're OK. When that email goes out, boom! We see it on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, because they get it. That's how they get there. That's how the whole thing starts. Um, so all of our goals can be hit from starting with getting that email address. So I say, oh, OK, well, if I get more people signed up to the email, everything else of our goals will be hit. So that's why what we did when I used to, let's say, Two years ago when we started this, I had like four calls to action. Sign up for consulting, sign up for this event, all kinds of, stop doing all that. Now we have one call to action on every page. Don't confuse them. What are you trying to have them do on every page and put it up there? That's all we do. Does that help at all? Yeah, the, the advertise, to be honest, our ads don't do much. Uh, our ads, we, we sell benefactor sponsorships to our customers, and most of what they get has nothing to do with a display ad. And I don't know if anybody is into the display ad business, but they're, they're not clicked on very much. Even calls to action type display, I would never buy a display ad because they just don't work. What I would want to do is I want to do what our influencers do and they say, hey, can I do a guest post on your site? That is much better. So if you're spending your time buying advertising on certain sites, what I would do is I would say, can I be an expert on that site? That's where you get the, I, there's um, a couple of our, because that's what you get as a sponsorship package. You can be a contributor. It goes through editorial just like everything else. Our, one of our benefactors that just signed up signed like a $100,000 program as soon as they put their post out. Because they're allowed, because they can be a thought leadership on the ne a thought leader on the network, so that's when you get to be a certain size that really, really, really pays off. Um, and happy to talk more about all that later. Happy to stay around. Question. Yes. The goal of getting this thirty thousand, one hundred sixty-one clicks, one hundred sixty-one thousand clicks, is ultimately to get people to embrace you or ask you to work for them. Is that correct? No, actually not. It's uh, ten percent of our business is uh, consulting. 
Yes, so it does come through there. About 95% of our traffic can be tracked to an email that we have. So I can tell you firsthand that we get all of our, almost all of our revenue through this, but they mostly buy um, tickets to the event. So the biggest, our biggest revenue driver is our event, Content Marketing World in Cleveland every September, Content Marketing World Sydney coming up in Sydney, Australia. We do workshops around the country. So, so a ticket to Content Marketing World is $1,295. So that's, and we had 1,000 people in Cleveland last year. <laughs> Ah, that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah, special drawing for that one. But just to give you an idea, but we need to get them on the list first. Rarely will people just come to the site and sign up. Usually we built a relationship with them through content, and then they buy our services, similar to what I'm telling everyone else to do. Good, good question. Yeah, we do, absolutely. We, we sell books. Yeah, you can get the book online. We, we published four or five different books, so we have content packages as well. So we're very much that traditional media model. For, oh, for the events? So she's asking what kind of technology we use for the events. We use two technologies. One's called Reg Online, and one's called Sign Up For, and these are more Cadillac versions. Like Eventbrite doesn't have the features that we need. Um, so we have, yeah, we have the industrial version. Sign Up For is relatively inexpensive, so if you're looking for a new one, I would check them out. You have to have an HTML programmer, though, that knows what they're doing. So let me get, talk about this because it's really important about how we're going to take the next step. How are we doing on time, by the way? Am I OK? I'm way over, probably. All right. So if, so, if somebody needs to go somewhere and you need to get up, but I'm getting to the good stuff. So all right. See, I, wait, all that other stuff didn't matter. Now this is the important stuff. So I want to give away content gifts. How do we do this? Let me go here. First, what I want you to do is define your hit list of influencers. What the heck does that mean? That means when, where are your customers hanging out online when they're not on your site? Simple enough. Are those media sites? Are those other bloggers? Where are they? How do you find that out? Use Track your keywords. Use tools like Google Alert. Use uh, things like TweetDeck and Twitter to find out what they're, what they're sharing. Um, whatever the case is, if you're in a more traditional industry that doesn't do a lot of sharing, Google Alerts is probably the best place to use. All you need is a free uh, Google account and to get them set up. Okay, so let's say start with 10 to 15. Here's where my customers are hanging out. Half of those will probably be bloggers. What do bloggers need to survive? They need content. They would love your help, but they're not going to pay any attention to you until you give them some love. Let's just be honest with it. You've got to do that. So you've got to give them content gifts. I'll give you an example. Here's what we did. Created something called the Content Marketing Playbook. There are 50 case studies in here uh, from 42 companies. Those 42 companies are customers or influencers that we're trying to make an impact on. When we sent them a note and said, hey, we just came out with this playbook, and you are featured on page 36, which we did to every one of them. You know what they did when they got that? They shared it a lot. So we had over, in a very short period of time, we had over 50,000 people download this, which made our sponsors very happy, by the way. And they now said, wow, they gave me a gift. I, who are these guys? I've got to pay attention. And we kept doing that over and over and over again. I, I mean, we did it with top lists, like top blogger lists. We did it with e-books. We did it in blog posts. We did all that kind of stuff to make sure that we build a relationship with them and never ask them for anything. We just did it because he said, hey, you're really doing good content. We wanted to feature your stuff. How do you do that on Twitter? Without, if you don't want to do a big content package, do it on Twitter. And actually, I'll go through this. Do a social media 411. Most people on Twitter, most people on Facebook, on LinkedIn, whatever your social channel of choice is, most people share content about um, themselves. Here's the way you should do it if you want this to work. One piece of 411, one, the first piece of content, that's your promotional piece. That's your PR release. That's your, you're awesome. You won this award that nobody cares about. Go put that on Twitter, and, and you can get that out of the way. Your, the next one, that is your piece of educational content that, you are, that is on your website that you are going to create every day, every week, whatever the case is. And then four, that is pieces of content that you're going to share from those influencers on that hit list. And you're going to share one every day from them. And you know what? They pay attention. They might not for one, they might not for two, but if you do five or six, they will pay attention. Are you agreeing with I me? I just have a success story about 
Uh, you have a thing you want to share? It? Yeah, I'll share it. Um, cause I saw your Give talk. me the abbreviated version. Oh, well, the, after seeing Jim's talk at the COSI um, event, um, I applied this. And I'm a couture jeweler, do all one of a kind pieces, and I just recently started showing it in New York Fashion Week. So this year, I'm stalking all the fashion editors for Vogue, L, W, all the major stylists for the Oscars. And I've been doing this since Christmas. And my Fashion Week show is coming up on February 14th. In engaging with them, many of them already said, we've got your event on the calendar. We'll see you there. And I'm a one-woman show with no budget. So what he's talking about works. Yay. <laughs> That's awesome. That's fantastic. So let me get through this, some of this stuff. Couple things that I'll share, and then we'll end up, and then I'll take questions and, until the library closes down. Um, it doesn't just have to be blog posts and how you do this. So let's talk about more about sharing. We did uh, this hundred content marketing examples thing. Very, very important. Those examples, same thing. Customers, influencers. Some were, some weren't. Anybody use SlideShare? Anybody know what SlideShare is? A couple people. SlideShare is the YouTube for PowerPoint presentations. Gets about 75 million unique visitors every month. I can, I can directly relate about a couple hundred thousand dollars in business that we've had directly through SlideShare. It is amazing. It is the most underutilized uh, place to get content. Think big content packages. Think ebooks, white papers, even videos that they have now. What's great is we put all this great content on our SlideShare channel. It's all optimized. So let's say, Joe, I don't have a credible website to Google. How do I get found? SlideShare does. Post your content on SlideShare. Make it visible, uh, good to interact with. We set it up so you get to about slide nine as people are looking at it. And by the way, there are lots of people searching for PowerPoints. You have no idea. It is amazing. B2B, B2C, doesn't matter. Um, we get a ton of leads right through this form, signing up for the same thing. Sign up for our newsletter. It's complete, they can click off of this, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people actually sign up for it. So if you're looking for a good lead generation activity to leverage your content, syndicate your content, look at SlideShare. And this is the last one that I would focus on, and then we'll get to questions. Uh, my good friend, Andrew Davis, he wrote a book called Brandscaping. It's basically on content co-creation. So a lot of you, I could see when we were talking about budgets, you're saying, I don't have a lot of budget. What do I do? Focus on some of your partners that target the same audience but are not competitive. It's called content co-creation, and, and Andrew calls it brandscaping. We, did the, we do this a lot. So this is our content marketing metrics piece. We did it with a company called Convince and Convert. We both target the same people, but we're not competitive. We, we work together on the content, and what happens when the content's released, we both spread it out. So basically, you get twice the impact because both databases send it out. And we've seen amazing resonance from on and on doing that. And we're able to reach his network, and he's able to reach our network. So think about some partners that you have that you can partner with. Say, hey, look, we both have limited budgets. Let's work together on some content. So this is my last, this is my last slide. See, last slide. Um, if you're not used to doing this, this is, feels really super weird. So start somewhere. Um, you'll feel a little bit out of control at times when you do it. It was really weird when we started. I mean, I've been in this business for a long, 13 years now, and we started the company. And it was weird when we started in 2007, 2008. And now when we're creating so much content and looking at it, we're still, I still feel we're not moving fast enough, but it's, we're kind of, sometimes you feel all over the place. But what I would do before you do any more Facebook content or you create any more pictures of cats, uh, to put on your social media channels. I would ask yourself a serious question about why you do that, and I think it'll change the way that you look at your marketing and really figure out how you can be useful and important to your customers. So last question before we, I know we're, I don't know if we're putting some things together, but I'm here to take some questions. And also um, wanted to ask, did everyone get their one thing? Yes? yes Fantastic. Thank you very much. Question. Go ahead. Uh, well, you can get, <laughs> if you go to contentmarketinginstitute.com, that's all we do. That's all we cover. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll be, I mean, you, you can have all kinds of good stuff that's on there. From a small business, like small, small, what, what kind of business do you have? I'm sorry, wellness? Oh, wellness center, very good. 
Um, we do have some health content on there. We just did a health conference last year that was specifically on uh, targeting mostly hospital side. But I would look at a, um, another site called Copy Blogger. They focus on mostly small businesses and startups. Same type of content marketing where we focus on a little bit bigger. So I would look at Copy Blogger. I would look at convinceandconvert.com. I would look at our stuff. Um, those, are the, those are probably the three that I would recommend if you're really looking to get started in there. There's a lot of really good books. I got my book is, is a good one. If you're really at basic, basic level, um, my first one, Get Content, Get Customers. This Managing Content Marketing would help. Content Rules is a good book by C.C. Chapman and Ann Hanley. Uh, the Now Revolution is a good book by Jay Baer. Um, the New Rules of PR and Marketing by David Meerman Scott is an excellent book. It's a little dated now, but it's a very, very good book. So any of that stuff, but most of it's available online, if that would be helpful. And if you can't find anything, please hold on. Email me or send me a note on Twitter and let me know, and I will, I will find a solution for you. Go ahead. Question. I was, was going to say, get content, get your book. It was great. Oh, thank you. And it wasn't boring. It was <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't boring. She said my book wasn't boring. That's so awesome because you're not using it for a doorstop. Thank you very much. So it would be good for a beginner, I think, because it really engages you when you start thinking about scenarios because you're just learning about other people's scenarios. It's kind of like a reality TV show. Thank you. Yeah. The good thing about Get Content, Get Customers is the whole second half of the book is just case study after case study, and it just goes through their problems and, and whatnot. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Question. Have you seen this work um, as far as like, educational systems and private schools? There, it's funny, we had about 30 educational systems and schools come to Content Marketing World last year. Um, and it's a, it, they're all working on it, it seems. I don't do a lot of work in that space, but we're definitely getting a lot more, uh, especially with the whole online training scenario and giving away uh, you know, information for free. We're starting to see it. I don't have a lot of good examples, but if you really need one, I'm sure we could find one for you. I'm working on the next book that I'm working on is out in September, and I'm going to have a whole section on nonprofit and uh, and educational. So okay. I'm working on it. That's okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Question? Go ahead. How much is too much with the magazine? Monthly, quarterly? Depends. How much? The question is, how much is too much with the magazine? Well, I guess it depends on what your goal is. What's your goal? Uh, increase, <laughs> increase fan base. Increase so you'd be doing it as a loyalty-driven vehicle. Yeah. The one thing to remember about so the, our magazine, by the way, if you want to subscribe to Chief Content Officer, go online. It's, it's free. Um, go and subscribe, and we'll send it to you in print. Um, the, our audience, so our buyer persona for online is completely different than the print. That's, that's mostly marketing executives. It's very strategic. It's very lean back technology while you know, our online is very lean forward. You have a problem, we're going to try to fix it. Um, I think the... the it, I love print, and it can do what you need it to do. I think it just depends on what your goals are, and it takes a while to get it going. So you have to stay committed to it. I mean, in general, I don't know if you're looking at, you know, so we send out 20,000 copies every quarter, and that's what we can do because that's what we have from sponsorship support to do. But generally, if you're looking at what a print magazine costs, you can say every page times $2,000. It's to send, in general, like if you're looking for a ballpark, it's in generally what it's going to cost you. So if you want to do 24 pager, you've got to be prepared to spend in all costs, including printing and list development, $48,000. Um, you can get it cheaper, no doubt about it, but there's a good, there's a good ballpark for you. The big co cost is in list development because we got, I've got to get all those people to opt into that so that I can get a better postal rates because it's going to cost about 45, 47 cents a piece to send that out right now, and I'd really like to send it for less. But I have to get periodicals rate to do that. And I have to have 50% of the people to opt in to get that, to get to that level. I love talking about print. So if you ever want to talk about print, send me an email. I'll, I'll talk about it. Uh, who is working with direct marketers to get the cost down? Yeah, they're always working to get the cost down. But it's not going down. <laughs> it's, uh, you, can, you can get favorable costs if you can sh prove that you are a membership-based organization or you have direct request or those types of things. So what we're going after is direct request, um, but it just takes a while to get there. So we're at 
you know, we're close to 10,000 people saying that they want to request it, but we've got to get to about 12 to get to the number to get to save on postage. So it just it just it just takes some time. Yeah, I would say for anybody out there looking to, I would say your platform probably should not start with print because it is it is quite a quite an investment to go there. But I I love I love the print vehicle, and I will as long as we can fund it, I will continue to fund it. So, other questions? Awesome. Orange. Oh, the orange? Yeah, the book covers orange. You're but everything's sure. orange. Everything's yeah. Orange. When I started, I left. So I left Penton, and I started to be um, asked to do keynotes and whatnot, speaking. First four or five speeches that I did, for whatever reason, I wore orange because it was the company color. And then I got asked to do, it was actually in Brussels, believe it or not, I got asked to come over to Brussels and do a speech. And they said, look, you can do a speech, but you can't wear orange. You have to wear black shirt, black tux, silver tie. I said, OK, that's fine. I mean, if you're going to pay me, I'll, I'll wear anything you want. Um, so so they, they ended up doing that. And then I came down off the stage. And even people in Belgium said, where's the orange? I said, are you kidding me? And then people that watch the video and stuff say, hey, I saw or saw the picture. Said, Where, where's your orange? I'm like, oh, I've already done. I've already branded myself. as." So from, when I, from that moment on, I went over the deep end <laughs> into orange. And it's really, it actually, it's really worked out. I can't show an ROI to it, but I, I believe that there is one. About every three weeks, somebody will send me something orange in the mail, believe it or not. I've got really nice Italian shoes that I wear at Content Marketing World that were given as a gift. Somebody sent it to me. I've got a couple portraits in the office that are that are orange. It's yeah, fantastic. The things, the things, you know, you're I have some them of them on the Pinterest on my Pinterest board. I have some of those. Yeah, if you, I have some really wacky. I have a custom made orange shirt or orange suit that I that I wore at the event. Like I came out, it it was hideous, but it was lovely all at the same time. So I really really go overboard. Yeah, it it absolutely does. So I, I guess I would say. This is what's awesome about being a small business today. You can really focus on what makes you eccentric and weird, and you can get business because of it. And I think in the past that wasn't the case. But now, the, whatever you can do to set yourself apart is better. I don't know. Anybody know Mari Smith? Yeah. Mari Smith is a social, so social media guru. She wears turquoise. Every, she does the same thing. And when you hear, when I saw her speak at Blog World a year ago, I walked in. She put. Um, she had uh, blue turquoise streamers, and she put she decorated everything in turquoise, and she gave away little turquoise. And I'm like, oh my gosh, but it works because everybody remembers Mari because of the turquoise. So I'm not going to give away streamers or anything like that. But but anyways, it's a good question. I like talking about. It.